is it legitimate? Should it exist? And why? Many ask these questions about various United Nations agencies whose anti-Israel bias is open and fluent. Today, many ask these questions about the International Criminal Court and add one more. What is the threat? Good afternoon and welcome to Shradadin's virtual roundtable on the International Criminal Court. I am Nitzana Darshan Leitner, the president of Shradadin Israel Law Center. During this difficult time, Shurat Adin, a leading civil rights organization, has brought our mission online. We have organized informative webinars to discuss pro-Israeli, pro-American matters. In addition, we have continued our pioneering anti-terror litigation against terrorists and their supporters. Please visit our website at israelawcenter.org for more information. In recent months, the International Criminal Court opened an investigation against Israel and against the United States. These two countries allege that neither Israel nor the United States are members in the International Criminal Court. The court has no jurisdiction over them. They have their own independent legal system and they do not need the International Criminal Court to criticize their legal affairs. Nevertheless, the court continues in its procedure. Today, we will discuss the legal and strategic situation with regard to Israel, the United States, and other democracies. Can the ICC be put on a sound structural footing? Is a world court doomed to be politically biased? How should Israel and the United States respond to the prospect of foreign nations arresting their citizens and transferring them to the hands of the ICC. We will discuss these issues and more in the webinar. Our program will consist of three parts. We will first hear from former Senator Joseph Lieberman. Then I will interview Professor Luis Moreno Campo, former Chief Prosecutor of the ICC. Finally, I will interview former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danone. Now, I'm honored to turn to former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danone, who also served as a Likud member and minister in previous governments. And I want to thank you and uh, Shuat Adin for hosting me today. Our pleasure, really, it's a good, great honor. So let's begin. The uh, Chief Prosecutor of the ICC, International Criminal Court, Mrs. Fadl bin Suda, has stretched and twisted her jurisdiction to attempt to reach Israel, even though Israel has not signed the Rome Treaty and is not a member of the ICC. Many of Israel's Arab neighbors are also not ICC members, but are involved in conflicts like in Yemen and Syria, which are far more deadly um, than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Why is the ICC targeting Israel? Why isn't the chief prosecutor concerned about other these conflicts? Does anti-Semitism play a role in this? So Nitzana, first let's look at, at the background, why it's coming to the ICC, and it starts with the Palestinians. For the last 72 years, they rejected every opportunity for peace, even now, when President Trump offered his peace initiative, they said immediately no. And instead of negotiating, they are conducting a, a diplomatic terrorism against Israel. And part of that campaign is to go to the ICC with ridiculous accusations and to blame Israel. And unfortunately, the ICC is cooperating with that. Instead of say, telling them, go speak with the Israelis, instead of coming to the ICC, you have, we have no jurisdiction here. The ICC uh, allowed them to, to enter the, the halls of the ICC, uh, and today they are continuing with their uh, attacks against Israel. Uh, yes, we can call it anti-Semitism, because when you see someone applying double standards against Israel, it's anti-Semitism. And I have no problem with criticism. I, I always told my colleague that the UN, we welcome your criticism, but use the same standards that you are using uh, on every other nation in the world, use it on Israel. But when you are using a double standard, a 
and you are blaming us for ridiculous accusations like using excessive force or illegal uh, so-called occupation of the land, this is the pure anti-Semitism. So do you think any chance that the prosecutor will similarly attempt to stretch her jurisdiction and try to investigate the wars in Syria and Yemen in the same way she's trying to reach the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? No way, no way, it, it will never happen because no one is pushing for that. In our case, you, you have the Palestinians uh, and all of those who support them, uh, some European countries that are, are backing them and, and they are pushing it. Uh, in the case of Syria, Yemen, Libya, you, you name it, uh, no one is pushing it and I don't think it will happen. Uh, and uh, also those countries that are fighting, you know, when they're trying, uh, somebody is trying to ask for uh, answers from for their leaders. And we are fighting back also, uh, and I think we have to be more vocal about it. We shouldn't be silent. We, we should call it what it is uh, and expose the intentions of the ICC. Thank you. Um, the United States, which is also not an ICC member, has personally uh, sanctioned members of the ICC and imposed financial penalties and travel bans because the ICC is attempting to investigate American officials over the conduct of the war in Afghanistan. Has Israel also banned ICC personnel from its territory, or should it? Uh, I'm not aware of that, but we have to remember, Nitsana, that you know, Israel is not the US, and I, I'm not sure we have the same power of the US, but one thing we can do, and, and I'm doing it, I'm asking our friend in the United States to apply the same kind of pressure on the ICC when it comes to Israel. That's what friendship is. That's when you speak about uh, the connection between Israel and the US, and they are the strongest ally of Israel today. We, we expect from them to apply the same measures, the same pressure, pushing the ICC to move on from this issue and, and to declare that they have no jurisdiction in this case. We have to remember, Palestine is not a state there is no reason for them to be accepted in the ICC. Um, do you think that there is a near-term risk that the ICC will issue arrest warrants for former Israeli soldiers and that Israelis traveling abroad will find themselves uh, apprehended for imagined war crimes? Um, do IDF veterans need to be concerned? So definitely we cannot ignore it. Uh, maybe it's not immediate, but if we will ignore it, uh, it can happen, and it happened in the past. So I think we have to be cautious about it. We, we have to fight against it, because if we will ignore it, some countries will cooperate. Not all of the countries, you know, we know that Germany already announced that they will not cooperate with that, and other European countries. But we don't want even one case of an Israeli soldier or officer who is traveling, arriving to the airport, and all of a sudden, Somebody will tell you that he's, he's under investigation or because of a, a warrant that will be issued. So uh, we cannot be quiet and we, we should deal with that. Right. Now, the Europeans have a great deal of influence in the ICC. Are they pushing the ICC to go after Israel or to halt? So I learned, you know, after serving five years at the UN, that, you know, you cannot name a group. You know, the European, it's not a group. The EU itself uh, uh -huh. are not united anymore. So right. Europe, for example, we have a very strong friends, uh, mainly in Eastern Europe. And today they are, they are stepping and speaking on behalf of Israel. They are not allowing the countries who are pushing against us uh, to be as dominant as, as they used to be. And, and we should encourage them, we should support them. And we, we do have issues with countries like Sweden, Ireland, they are the ones who are pushing against Israel, uh, and I'm sure they are involved also with the ICC. What we should do, we should speak with our colleagues in Eastern Europe, uh, Germany, the UK, uh, and other countries, and ask them to be more vocal about it. Right, right, 100%. Um, now we'd like to jump to topics and discuss your experience serving as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations in New York. Having just finished up a long tenure in New York, serving um, as the ambassador, can you tell us a little 
about your experience there, where you met with a lot of anti-Israel opposition. So, uh, you know, I, I served at the UN for five years. It's, it's a long time and it felt like 50 years. Uh, hmm. and we accomplished a lot and we were able to change uh, things on the ground uh, thanks to the, the help we got from the US with Ambassador Haley and many other uh, friends from all around the world. But I found out that at the UN, you have the public UN, where you have a lot of hostility against Israel, many resolutions condemning Israel, and you have the private UN, which is uh, exciting when you can actually get things done quietly. You can cooperate with countries that we do not have diplomatic relations. And in the last few days, we saw the agreements that were signed with the, the UAE and Bahrain. And I was involved on, on building those bridges and conducting uh, quiet relationships and cooperation with many moderate uh, Muslim countries. And I'm happy to see that today uh, they are becoming public. So I think our goal is to push our friends who are afraid to admit about the cooperation with Israel, we should push them more and encourage them to publicly acknowledge what we are doing together. Right, I would like to delve into this, but uh, first, um, what was the really memorable experience at the UN? So, you know, I'm very active by nature. So uh, almost every uh, week we had an event at the UN and I brought Judaism into the hall of the UN. We celebrated all the Jewish holidays and now that we are celebrating the Jewish high holidays, I remember when we conducted a Tashlich ceremony in oh. the UN with the Secretary <laughs> General. And, yeah. and that was very uh, comfortable because we have the East River and we invited well, exactly. all the ambassadors. I to ask which river you went. <laughs> so we did it actually from the UN. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and we tossed the bread and uh, it was very symbolic because I think at the UN they have uh, a lot of uh, things to repent on. So when we explain them the meaning of, of Yom Kippur uh, yeah. and making tshuva, we, we actually told them directly that they should look at what they, they actually did regarding Israel. Uh, and I think being very direct uh, and bringing Judaism helped us to, to have a conversation and to change mind of many, many countries. So um, did you forge a lot of ties with other diplomats on a personal level? Uh, indeed. And, you know, the best way to to bring people to understand Israel is to bring them to Israel. I know that you do it in Shuat Adin, you have great missions mm -hmm. that people are coming and, and learning and meeting uh, people on the ground. And that's what I did at the UN. I brought myself more than 100 UN ambassadors. Wow. For most of them, it was the first visit to Israel. And actually I got to understand the challenges, to see the tunnels of Hezbollah and Hamas, to speak with the leaders from Israel, and I remember when I took Ambassador Nikki Haley on her first visit uh, to Israel and, and we took a helicopter, you know, she, she got it. Once you see the size of Israel and, and the challenges that we are facing, uh, people go back to their countries and, and they are still remembering those trips. And many of those ambassadors left the UN and became head of state, ministers of foreign affairs, and they still remember the week we spent together here in Israel. Wow. Wonderful. Um, so can you tell us what was your biggest achievement at the UN? So we had a, many achievements and I think what you know, we saw with the UAE and Bahrain, I am proud to be part of that. But personally, I think the greatest achievement was the, the, the day I was elected to become the chairman of the UN Legal Committee. We, right. have, we have six committees at the right. UN, permanent committees, and Israel never ran for a position at the UN. And I said, why not? You know, we are a member state, we're paying our dues. Let's try, even if we fail, so what? Uh, it wasn't easy. You know, they blamed me and blamed Israel for uh, violating international law. And they say, how can we share a, a legal committee with uh, the occupation and all those uh, lies against Israel? And I worked very quietly. I collected the votes. And at the end of the day, when we conducted the, the vote in the General Assembly, I received the support of 109 member states and only 44 voted against me. And for me, it was a great moment that where people actually supported Israel. I became the chairman of a committee for a year, uh, dealing with international law and legal issues. And we proved them that Israel can actually do everything at the UN. And, and we broke the glass ceiling. And I think for the future, 
Uh, now we can run for every position at the UN. Amazing, amazing. So I'm sure in order to achieve this goal, you needed to speak to ambassador from states that had no ties to Israel. I don't know if you can tell us. Um, you may not, but uh, which country surprised you with the relationship to Israel? And were you able really to connect with those who have no ties to Israel? So everything is personal, uh, also at the <laughs> UN. So uh, I made many, fr uh, many friends at the UN, and it was real. You know, sometimes I would uh, have breakfast with the ambassador, and after that I would meet him in the, in the elevator of the UN, and he would not acknowledge me, because there were other Muslim ambassadors in the same elevator. And that was weird for me. Actually, it changed. Before I left, we felt the change. People became more friendly, more open uh, to Israel. And I, I'm happy to, to see that change. But uh, I, I can tell you one thing that I, I was surprised to see the amount of interest about Israel. And not only on negative issues. I think many ambassadors, they look at us as a role model uh, for innovation and technology. And we should use it more. We should uh, help them. We should share uh, our knowledge and technology with more developing countries. Uh, and I think we will uh, gain a lot of respect by doing it. So it's, it's a real tikkun olam, but also it will uh, support our diplomatic efforts in the future. So people look up to Israel, and I think we should take advantage of that. So to this extent, what advice would you give to the new ambassador uh, coming in? I told the incoming ambassador that he shouldn't be silent. Uh, he should be uh, active and uh, he shouldn't ignore uh, what they are saying about Israel. When somebody is even saying one lie, you have to go on the attack because otherwise it, it will add up. So when you see a report, demand them to correct it. When somebody is speaking against us, attack him and his country. I think that's the approach I apply. And, and it worked. And we saw that the things are changing. And I, I think that the, being uh, on the attack and not playing defense, that is the only way to win at the UN. Right. Um, and I must ask this question as well. What was the defeat that Israel suffered diplomatically during their, your term? So the, the hardest moment for me was uh, before President Obama left uh, his right. office. Uh, right. December 2016, he pushed forward a resolution, a shameful resolution, I have to say, resolution 2334, and, mm. and I want to quote from the resolution. It called our presence in the old city of Jerusalem a flagrant violation of international law, and, and it was pushed by the U.S. And I was there by myself in the Security Council fighting the U.S. Usually it was me and the U.S. fighting the rest of the world, but here I was right. by myself. Uh, fighting everybody, and unfortunately the resolution passed in the Security Council. Uh, but when I spoke there, I told them that we have a strong uh, commitment to the land, we have a strong uh, connection, and we will overcome this resolution. And uh, a year after, I found myself in the same room, speaking about the strong decision, the bold decision of President Trump moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So it proved to the world that even when we have a, a low moment, we are determined, we are strong, and we prevail. Amen. <laughs> um, now back to the peace agreements. Many Israelis are excited about the new relationship with Bahrain and the UAE. In what ways will the new partnership be different from past peace agreements? So I visited the UAE a few years ago. You know, it was done uh, in a way that we had to keep it quiet and I respected mm -hmm. their, their request, but we cooperated with them in the past and I visited other Muslim countries. And, and I'm very optimistic because what I felt that we have a chance now to have peace among people, not only among leaders. When you, you look at the important peace accord between uh, Israel and Egypt and Jordan, you don't see Jordanians or Egyptians traveling in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Right. I think with the Gulf countries, there is a chance to actually make the bond be between the Israelis and the Emirates and, and other nations in the Gulf. I'm sure you will see many Israelis flying to visit there. You, but you Absolutely. also see many... I'll be the first one to go. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful place and it's a short flight. Uh, once we will have a direct flight, it's only three hours. But right. we will see many, many tourists coming from, from the Gulf to Israel. 
and, and I, I've spoken with many friends in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Bahrain in the last few weeks, and they are eager to come first to see the history, uh, the culture, uh, and also to seek business opportunities, investments, uh, and I think it will be a great opportunity for all of us. So I'm optimistic about it, and I'm sure in the next few weeks, we will see uh, more countries joining this cycle of peace. Right, so you do, do you believe that the Middle East is now changing for better for Israel? Uh, uh, for sure, uh, and it came from the decision of President uh, Obama to sign the Iran uh, peace agreement. So, you know, we can say a lot of bad things about this agreement, but one good thing happened that it brought us together. And when I worked with uh, those ambassadors in the UN, you know, they told me that they are really worried about their future because of the, the Iranian aggression in the region. So I think it's, it's important for us, it's important for them. And I think if we will see the Saudis and other countries joining, that would be a, a great move that we are waiting for. And if we speak about the other players uh, in this conflict, the Palestinians, do you think that they are missing a big opportunity now? Like always. You know, when President Trump stepped in, uh, he wanted to give them a chance, uh, and they missed it. When Ambassador Haley came in, she wanted to meet with them and listen to them, and they attacked her personally. And also today, after we signed the treaty with the UAE and Bahrain, two uh, nations that supported the Palestinians with hundreds of millions of dollars over the years, they are personally attacking the leadership uh, of those nations. So, unfortunately, that are continuing to reject every possibility, every opportunity. And I pray for the day that the uh, Palestinian leader will emerge, like Anwar Sadat of Egypt, that will put uh, the past behind and will focus on the future. When that day will come, we will be here willing to negotiate and hopefully uh, sign a, uh, an agreement. But when we look today at President Abbas and the people around him, I am not very optimistic about it. Um, as usual. Uh, you mentioned President Trump. We are all watching the upcoming American presidential elections with concern and um, waiting to see. Uh, so how important is this election for Israel and what is at stake here for the Israeli country? So I, I was very cautious, you know, uh, not to get involved with uh, U.S. politics when I was a diplomat and I think I should continue with that approach. But I always say that we cannot take for President Trump uh, his actions, his decisions regarding Israel. We have to acknowledge it. And we should be grateful for his bold decisions. First of all, pulling from the uh, Iran uh, agreement, the JCPOA. Second is uh, moving the embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to Jerusalem. And third, recognizing our sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Uh, and now we are, we are seeing the, the new initiative. So we should be grateful for, for those decisions. Uh, but I'm optimistic. Regardless of the outcome of the elections, I'm sure the, the bond between the U.S. and Israel is a strong one. And we will continue to work closely with the U.S. because it's the interest of the U.S. to work with Israel. And it's the interest of Israel to work with the U.S. It's not one way. And I, and I want to tell you a story if we have time, Insana. Sure. Every year... There is a vote in the General Assembly regarding the sanctions against Cuba. Uh, out of 193 countries, only two countries support the sanctions, the U.S. and Israel. And every year I told my staff, whenever there is a vote about Cuba, I want to come personally and to vote with the U.S. Not because we are really involved with the issue of Cuba, but because that's friendship. The same way the U.S. is standing with us when we need them, I walked in uh, every year into the General Assembly and voted by myself with the U.S. regarding the issue of Cuba. So it, it goes both ways, and I think that's why we should uh, continue uh, with the strong bond we have, regardless of uh, politics and the outcome of the elections. So you mentioned sanctions. Uh, it brings into the uh, Iranian sanctions. Um, what do you learn from the uh, U.N.? Uh, about uh, how we can meet the challenge of uh, Iran and uh, Hezbollah? So when, when I, I spoke uh, last week with uh, friends in, in Washington, I told them 
it's good that you come to the UN only to expose the hypocrisy of the UN. Don't expect to get results, don't expect to get support, just expose the hypocrisy of the UN. But if you really want to put pressure on Iran, the US will have to lead it directly. And that's what today they are doing. Secretary Pompeo announced about it. And I think the US should continue with uh, putting pressure directly uh, against Iran, ignore the governments. And I think we will see more companies, mainly European companies, that will think twice before working with the Iranian companies. I think that is the best way to move on. Wow. Oh, I see I left one question about the presidential elections. Uh, any prediction of uh, who Americans will choose, Trump or Biden? Well, uh, we will enjoy uh, the process. We, by the way, we should appreciate the democracy that we have and that the Americans have in the U.S. When you look at the U.N. today, out of 193 nations, you don't have too many democracies. Many of them call themselves democracies, but the ambassador tells me, Danny, we know the outcome of the elections before they, we conduct the elections. And when you look at the, the U.S. and Israel, we, are, you know, we have real democracies. Uh, we don't know the outcome of the elections. Uh, and we should be uh, grateful for the fact that we, we, we live in such an environment. Well, we can tell you are a good diplomat. Um, <laughs> where do you see your career going uh, from here? First, I'm very happy to be back in Israel uh, with my family. I'm very uh, happy to, to spend the high holidays, even though it's difficult today with the, with the corona, but to be in Israel. And I intend to, to stay involved, uh, to use the, the knowledge, the connection, the experience I gained uh, over the years uh, to support the country I love. So my friend Nikki Haley told me that not to come out with any declarations too fast. So uh -huh. it, was, it was the right uh, uh, piece of advice. I, I will wait, but definitely I intend to come back to, to public life and to be involved in Israel. Wow. And we'll be very happy to have you back. Any other thoughts you would like to share? Uh, I want to thank uh, you and the great team of Shuat Adin for the hard work that you're doing all year long and to wish a uh, friend of Shuat Adin and the audience a uh, happy new year, Shana Tova. And we should remember that uh, even though we are ch facing challenging time, uh, at the end of the day, when you look at the history of Israel and the Jewish people, we always were able to prevail. And I'm sure that the uh, next year, we will be in a much stronger position. Thank you so much, Danny. It was a pleasure having you. Great honor. Good luck. Thank you very much, Nitana. Thank you. That was an amazing discussion. Now I would like to use this opportunity to share with you a story. This is a young girl that Shuratadin is representing in a libel suit that tried to get justice to these former IDF soldiers. Please watch the video. over the social media and many, many joined and supported Rebecca's story. In the end of the day, Rebecca's story is our story. We are all IDF soldiers. We are all defending our soldiers. We are all joining this case. Please support us in this endeavor. 
And now back to the ICC. Moreno Campo is an Argentine attorney who served as the first chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Prior to his tenure as chief prosecutor, he was the lead prosecutor in the Argentine Federal Court, responsible for investigating and prosecuting the abuses of members of the military junta, which ruled Argentina from 1975 until 1983. He has taught law at Harvard, Stanford, and Buenos Aires universities. Good evening, Professor Moreno Campo. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, the International Criminal Court. Many of our viewers are not familiar so much with the ICC or how it works because many are not citizens of these countries which are members of the ICC. Uh, can you give us just a brief you know, introduction to the structure of the ICC uh, and uh, an outline of its personal and subject matter jurisdiction? Okay. The, the issue is normally criminal justice is national normally. It's like the flag and the currency is national. The first time there was an international criminal court was Nuremberg because of the Holocaust, because of the Nazi crimes. So that was the beginning and for a while it was the end. So the, the not Nuremberg was, in the, the, the case was done in 1945, 46. And for two years more, American judges, no more international judges, will continue doing 12 more cases. But the Cold War right. suspended, suspended this possibility. The end of the Cold War, in the 90s, we have the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then in the Yugoslavia we have crimes, and the Europeans decided to do something different, and the Europeans promote uh, International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia. That's when, that was 1993. And the next year was 1994, Rwanda, Rwanda genocide. The world did nothing, did nothing to stop the genocide in Rwanda. One million people were killed. And therefore, there was a creation of a new international tribunal for Rwanda. And then that paved the way to a coalition of African countries with Mandela leading, because Africa was coming out from the upper height. South America was finishing the dictatorships and Europe tired of wars. And these three groups, plus Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, they built, Israel was supporting that. Israel right. was supporting the creation of the International Criminal Court because basically that was in fact, International Criminal Court is fight, it was an aspiration of Israel. Right. When, when you see Eichmann, you see, the judges were thinking that should be done by international court, not by, not by Israel court. But there was no, so Israel had to do it. So Israel was always supporting this idea. Israel was one of the supporters. Uh, and also US. But then in the debate, in the debate at Rome, the biggest discussion was the independence of the prosecutor to decide where to go. To go to Israel or to go to Vietnam or to go this or that. And U.S. want to control the court and the Security Council. Security Council had to decide where to go. Then the prosecutor will be free to select incidents and suspects. The, but many countries say, no, this is political. We need a legal court. And they decided the prosecutor will be independent. And that was a big debate. And 120, 120 countries vote for yes and was adopted against U.S., against China. And in 2003, they had more than 60 countries who ratified the treaty and then it started operations. And they called me, offered me the job because my Argentina case, because my Argentina experience, they called me to offer me the job. I, can I was teaching at Harvard in those days. I, I, I stopped it, I resigned. And I, yes, I, I, I accepted it. I think it's, it's for me, nothing could be better. I was teaching a I was teaching a course on corruption, but also a small seminar called How to Establish the Rule of Law in the World. That was the title of my seminar. And they offered me to be the ICC chief prosecutor. I said, yes, of course. So I, what they, it was complicated for me because I have a family and my kids stay in Buenos Aires, but I went to the Hague for nine years to establish the institution. And basically we put the institution in motion. And, 
and we start cases first in Congo and Uganda, and then the Security Council gave us that full situation, and the call was evolving. And in 2009, what happened was the Palestine Minister, Minister of Justice came to the office and accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Right. We're going to get to the Palestinian issue in a, in a yeah, moment. It, just it was, okay, because at the before this, it was mm -hmm. because basically, let me let me present shortly. Because what happened in 2009, the Palestine Minister came to my office requesting my intervention, and let me present what happened. I said to him, he explained to me how important for Palestine was this. And I said, Minister, I understand the importance, but I can offer just my impartiality and respect for the law. And talking about the law, there is a problem here because the state, the, the, the statute, the wrong statute requires a state as a jurisdiction. And it's not clear that you're a state. And, and he was very smart because he not made me a political point. He not made, oh, we need to do it. In my pool. He said, I, it's okay, I accept that. Let me brief you. Give me the right to brief you. I, I cannot say no. Of course you got the right to brief me. Okay. So, and that's why they start to brief me. And when they finish the brief, I say, okay, I'm sorry. You are not a state. It's the General Assembly decide you're a, before the UN, that is a system to come case to the court, you are not a state. So I cannot decide you're a state. Go to the UN, go to the assembly party, to the political bodies and decide and come back if you, if you get something. But I reject it. And that was the origin of the story. That's why I became for three years involved in the Palestine Israel case. Yeah. Um, so before the Palestinian case, which was in the end of your tenure, uh, I would like to, so, uh, for you to give us an example of cases that you uh, decided to prosecute in the ICC or decided to decline from uh, prosecuting. Okay, first, in, in, uh, when I was a prosecutor, we had no chance to go to Iraq or, or Iraq or Israel because they are not state parties. So mm -hmm. the court cannot open investigations in non-state parties. That's the rule. So we respect the rule. So we choose the most serious crime under the court jurisdiction that happened in those days in Congo and Colombia. Okay. In both situations, there were 5,000 people killed in a few months. The, the difference between both Colombia and Congo is that Colombia was conducting national proceedings. Therefore, the system that the system has is there have to be two conditions. Crimes against humanity, genocide, or war crimes, plus no, no national investigation. In Colombia, there was national investigation, so the case was we, we should not open the investigation. In Congo, it was different. There were war crimes, crimes against humanity, 5,000 people killed, plus no investigations. Therefore, we decided to open Congo first. At the same time, the second was Uganda, with the Low Resistance Army, it's a militia group who abduct kids and, and force them to kill the parents to, to become warriors. And, uh, and we still were running the show for 20 years, so we start a case in Uganda. And, and as a consequence of that, when the full genocide started, the Security Council decided to give the case to us. So that was the type of crime we're doing, massive atrocities, massive crimes. I see, I see. Um, as the ICC prosecutor, you close a preliminary inquiry into the Mavi Marmara incident, in which Israel intercepted a vessel attempting to breach its naval quarantine of Gaza. Remember the case. Yeah. Uh, the pre-trial chamber subsequently ordered your successor to reopen and re-reopen the inquiry into this incident. Do you feel that this unprecedented procedure was problematic in any way? The, the Navi Marmara case was brought to the court when Fatou Ben Souda was a prosecutor, the person who replaced me, and she evaluated the case and she decided that because there were just nine people killed, she said like, it's not serious enough, has not the gravity required for the war crime. Because the, the, stat, the statute said, the statute said, 
that the war crime had to be grave. But it's a particular request to grave war crimes. And she decided it's not enough. The Peter Chamber has a chance to he tried to review that and force her to review the decision. And um, and she she did it and she said no again. So they had the Peter Chamber insisted, she had to appeal. But it showed two things for me that are important for Israel. First, this is a court of justice. There are different views, the judges have different views. It's not a political decision. There are legal arguments there. Uh, but, and the prosecutor is independent. The prosecutor really is independent. She, she was, she's not biased against Israel or in favor of Palestine or against Palestine. She's independent. Uh, and she, she decided it would not proceed the case. And she did not. She persisted on that idea. And it's the same prosecutor now that opened the investigation on Palestine and now is, is explaining what she will investigate. So I understand normally Israel-Palestine is a in political context. I, I saw that. I saw that many times. But the ICC is different. And, uh, and that's why the argument that, oh, it's political. No, it's not political. It's complicated. It is complicated. And that's why I like uh, this interview, because I think we should explore, okay, what is the opportunity here? Because I think this could be an opportunity for Israel and Palestine to transform the interaction, to do something different. And I think probably will not happen, but I like this interview, at least explaining my view, I think could happen. Could happen that we can find um, a different solution where you have a, a type of a agreement that can, can avoid this. So, you know, based on your advice, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, the Palestine Authority went to the UN and upgraded its status to uh, a state, observer state. Stop there. Stop there. It was not my advice. My, <laughs> it was not my advice. I say what the law, in my view, would say. The prosecutor cannot decide who is a state, who is not a state. I don't think it's a criminal okay. prosecutor at all. It's only the UN. No, the, in the particular in the in the system of the ICC in the Rome Statute, the the decision to to be a member uh, is had to be filtered through the Secretary General of the UN. And so I said, okay. That's the way to, and in the first filter is the Secretary General of the UN who decide, okay, this is a state fulfilling all the criteria and will be a member of this treaty. That is the criterion. I say, okay, that is, that's the system. Follow the, follow the system. I not, I not give advice. Is this, this is a legal system. If you do the legal system, fine. But now, in the, according to the legal system, you are not considering a state. What happened was the Palestinian went to the General Assembly and they got a lot of votes to be considered a, UN, a state observer. So they, they were modified to be a state, not a member of the UN, but they considered a state observer. I wasn't about the Vatican or Switzerland, that type of entities. So that's what they got. And after that, they went back to the SEC and requested to the court, okay, now we are a state for the UN, you got to accept us as a state party. And the Asian state party accepted it, except Canada. Canada was the only country who objected, saying, no, this is not, we need to discuss that. But the Asian state party recognized the decision and treated them as state party since uh, 2015. So that that is, for the prosecutor, the point, the point, the prosecutor cannot review the decision of the Assembly parties. Palestine, maybe not for Israel, it's a political decision. You know, I know the Montevideo Convention established legal criteria, but at the end of the day, it's a political decision. Some states consider states and not. The issue for the ICC legal system, after the UN General Assembly upgrade Palestine to be a state, for the ICC Palestine is a state party, and therefore has the right to present cases in the court. The issue debated 
there are two issues important debate. One is about, okay, if Palestine is a state, what is the territory of Palestine? That is a crucial question. And there are two, Palestine in particular, after the wall decision, believe it's very clear. And in fact, that is normally the perception, international perception. Israel has a different position. I understand. But uh, in any case, the court was very, very prudent. The prosecutor, again, was very prudent, was not jumping. The prosecutor requests first to the Petrolia Chamber a ruling on, on some specific territories of, of are part or not of Palestine. That is the ruling that now we're expecting. And that is the situation today. But when you see the process, the process is not showing a political entity. It's not showing a biased prosecutor. It's showing a group of lawyers, a prosecutors and judges, respecting the legal. You can have different views, but there is no, for me, there's no doubt the court is acting prudently on this issue. It's, of course, no one wants, so I understand Israel refusing to understand that, but uh, I think it will be better for Israel if, if they invent a different solution, not just say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not good. I think it's better for Israel if they invent a solution and we can discuss what are the options, what is the option for Israel. But the system is, is, uh, is not developed against Israel. The system is not based on political decisions, except the, the political decision, really, the, the, the UN decision, but the court itself is not making, is not making political call, it's making legal decisions. And, uh, and it's an opportunity for Israel to, to think how to, how, to, how to face the crisis, no? <laughs> well, there are, our views is that there are other places that Israel can solve the conflict with the Palestinians. Uh, according to the Oslo Accords, it has to be bilateral between the Palestinians to Israel, not for any international organization or body or court to determine where Israel's borders will go or which part will be uh, controlled by Palestine Authority or Palestine State whatsoever. But this is the uh, argument that we are having um, with the court. By the way, does it, in your eyes, does it create a tension between the uh, Oslo Accords, which were um, kind of a treaty or international uh, kind of a law, to the uh, General Assembly resolutions that, uh, you know, it's only advisory uh, decision. The UN resolution suggested that the uh, Palestinian Authority will become a Palestinian observer state, but the Oslo Accord says no, they just remain Palestinian Authority. Okay, that, that, I don't think that would be the crucial part of the discussion at the court. The, at, the, at the court, the prosecutor is presenting three types of cases. Crimes committed by Hamas, Alleged war crimes committed by Israel forces, but the most complicated thing is the settlement, the transfer of population. Mm -hmm. Because that is, that is a crime that Israel is not considering a crime. There, that is a real issue. Because I suppose Israel would be happy if the prosecutor opened investigation against Hamas. I don't think Israel would have a problem with that. Hamas, mm -hmm. I could adjust to that, so we'll see. And I think that's, that's a very interesting part. Because in my time, a professor alleging to be representing Hamas was coming to see me, telling me about Hamas who like to do criminal case themselves. They like to stop this and investigate themselves. So I think it's a piece of this conversation that Israel is missing that is a chance to manage the Hamas conflict in different way, using criminal investigation to stop that. Then you have the alleged war crimes committed by Israeli forces. That is not so complicated because Israel has the primacy. So if Israel conduct genuine proceedings, we will be respected. And Israel, will, Israel, I think, is ready to investigate war crimes, and it does. So you can solve in this way. The problem for Israel is that the settlements, 
the transfer of population to occupied territories is, is not a crime in Israel. And therefore, Israel cannot invoke complementarity or the idea of national proceedings to stop ICC. And that's the crucial problem, I think, in this case. Uh, the problem is the, the war crime exists in the ICC statute. Yes, it was, it is part of the Geneva Convention, but the Arab world was pushing for it. But the Arab yeah. world was that. Right, right. And there, even there are just two Arab countries in the ICC, Lebanon, um, Jordania and um, uh, Tunisia and Tunisia, the Arab world as such was lobbying and including the statute, the crime. So the crime exists, it's there. And it's part, it's, it's coming from the Geneva Convention. So it's not, a, it's not invented. Um, it's connect, there are some interpretation, Israel has a different interpretation of the crime. That, that is legally fine, you can discuss that. It's, it's a crime, coming from the genocide, in fact. It's a crime, it's a crime created in, as a consequence of the Nazis. So the crime is there. And that is the biggest problem for Israel, I think, because Israel uh, has to invent something to manage the problem. So that is a debate at the ICC. It, it's not political. We, I don't think we'll be about Oslo. You can, you, you can present again the debate on statehood, but it's a debate that I think it's complicated because already the General Assembly recognized Palestine international forest, and you have the ICC, the Assembly of the parties of the ICC doing the same. So I think it's complicated for Israel to win that argument. The, the, the crucial issue for Israel is how to manage the settlement in a different way. And that is, that is for me, the challenge. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the uh, Hamas uh, grave violations, the rocket attacks. You mentioned the IDF operations in Gaza and uh, the Israeli home constructions in the West Bank and uh, East Jerusalem, um, which is the scope of the uh, Mrs. Uh, ben Suda's uh, proposed yeah. investigation. What about the Palestinians? Do you, you found that uh, they were totally uh, taking off there are no allegations concerning the uh, officials of the Palestinian Authority. Are they given a free pass? Look, you can. This is just the conclusion of the preliminary examination phase, where the prosecutor did not send investigators yet. The prosecutor is based her decisions on information provided by different sources. If you believe there are more crimes to be investigated. You can present the, the, the facts yeah. to the prosecutor and analyze that. So the prosecutor has the discretion to take it or not, but you, you have solid evidence of crimes committed by other parties. You, you can present them, absolutely. So I'll, I'll tell you what we did. Uh, our group, Shurat Dean, has uh, repeatedly sent communication to the prosecutor uh, concerning the Palestinian Authority's pay to slay policy. It's a program where the PA pays salaries and pensions to Palestinians convicted of terror offenses. Uh, we claim this is a reward and inducement, inducement to violence against Israelis. Uh, but Mrs. Bunsuda has not indicated that she intends to investigate or prosecute these payments. So, in light of these facts, do you think that the scope of the prosecutor's proposed investigation is fair? The, the issue is um, following. The, after the investigation is open, the prosecutor has still the discretion to add different crimes. So, would you suggest that... Not too late. It's always, yes, it's not too late, absolutely not. So, but the issue is, uh, investigating more crime will, will I, don't, I, I, I don't think that the investigating more people will solve the Israel concerns. No? Israel concerns are more about this case is crossing the policy to establish settlements in, in, the, in, in the zone. So that's a problem.
that's the problem for Israel. Okay. So if we focus on the settlement issue, uh, and I will... That's my opinion. <laughs> opinion. Legally, there are yeah. different solutions, but this, this case, the settlement, the transfer of population, uh, has, um, is, a real, is a real limit to the plan of settlements. So that's why for the Palestinians it's so important and that's why for Israel it's so important because it's a, it's a crucial part of the disputed territory, no? I see. Um, so I would like to, um, I would like to jump into another area in the world that also have a population transfer, which is uh, Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is a member state of the ICC and uh, several separate groups have filed uh, communications with the prosecutor uh, concerning terrorist activities in northern Cyprus. And the uh, Cyprus delegations are in substance the same as those lodged with a court by the Palestinian Authority and deal with Turkey's settlement activity in the portion of Cyprus which Turkey forces occupy. The uh, Office of the uh, Prosecutor has yet to act on any of these communications, even though they have been pending since 2014, before the Palestinian referral. Do you think that uh, the Prosecutor can credibly move forward with the Palestinian referral without acting on the Cyprus communications? But well, look, the, I don't know the Cyprus situation, and it's interesting that because the Israel case, you present a similar problem in another country, because that is the, con that, that the value of the International Criminal Court, that you see the world with some rules and saying, who else is breaking the rules here, okay? Mm -hmm. The prosecutor has discretion to, in, in particular in timing, when she moves in one situation, when she moves in a different situation. Because you know, there are many situations before the SEC. There are plenty. It have, you have Ukraine, you have Georgia. Now there are six state parties demanding that Venezuela should be under investigation. Uh, so there are many, there are many demands on the prosecutor. And um, she has expression to, to, to select the priorities that what she can, she can do. So, the fact that it's a, similar, it's a similar situation is not it's precluding the possibility to act in one situation. And then eventually she could work in the other situation. Or what happens sometimes is you acting once, I, I remember because the Uganda case about child soldiers and the Congo case about child soldiers, in Nepal, militia start to liberate child soldiers. So, the, the interesting thing would happen with the court, the one case in one country reverberate in a different country. So that's why the, you, the argument you're making is to make, oh, I, I see it's not impartial because it's ignoring this crime. You can think that, but I believe that's happening all the time. There are many, many crimes in the world, sadly, and the ICC is doing some of them. And the prosecutor has some discretion in terms of, in particular, in priority, uh, when it starts, when, when it start, where it started. So that was happening. For me, your arguments are legally right, and then maybe it's a case in Cyprus, and that's fine. That's, that's okay. That, and the prosecutor maybe should open, uh, but it's not making illegal the, the Palestinian case. At the point. So that's why for me, Palestinian case now is a reality. How to face reality? How to manage the conflict? And there are different ways. Not to, because I, I, I wrote that many years ago because when, Israel, when Palestine joined the ICC, I presented, okay, this is in some way an important decision because when you join the ICC, you decide we are not going to commit crimes. So that's why the joining of the SEC is its idea to end it, the possibility of crimes to achieve Palestine goals. 
And that's something we should highlight and we're ignoring. Palestine being a state party is proposing no more crimes. That's why Hamas could be sensible to the idea, okay, guys, stop the crimes or we, you will be investigated. So I think it's a chance to manage this conflict in a different way, if, if we can. I, 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 yes, my feeling is I learned that no one can decide on these issues. It's complicated. And I see how difficult it is for people in the, involved in the conflict for so many years. At the same time, as foreigners, what we can do is respecting you, respecting all of you, telling, okay, but maybe you can think in this different way. And that's why I appreciate this conversation with you. I appreciate it too. It was very fascinating. Uh, really, it's, a, it's an honor to speak to you, Mr. Romero Campo. Thank you, before, thank before you we, so much. Before we finish, let me present, yes. okay, you're talking about, what Israel and Python could do? Let me present one idea. Sure. Because the rules are the IGC could not do a case when there are relevant national proceedings. So the problem is that it's easy to do it on Israel forces. Hamas would do. But on the settlement, it's not possible because it's legal. So for me, the solution there is to create a committee to evaluate the problem where Palestine accepted that that committee will manage the problem and build in a way that tell the court, okay, court, let us do that ourselves. Don't infringe on us. Let us manage this, we'll present, we'll do it properly. So I think use complementarity as a mechanism, invent a complementarity mechanism to, to create a buffer zone, allowing Palestine and Israel to have a new discussion, different debate, uh, and avoiding the, Israel, the ICC investigation. That for me could be a solution uh, that requires political decision, require that, okay, we'll do it. I know there is no trust, I understand that, but uh, I think, um, Time to be creative, no? Because how many more years people will kill each other in, in Israel and Palestine? Come on, we need a solution for that. The new generation people need a different future, all of them. So I believe it is possible. There is a technical possibility, so it's inventing a complementarity model to manage the conflict. Between, could be international, could be bilateral, could be different ways, but. Uh, that is solution for the problem. So it's not making legal argument in the SEC, is okay, understanding the pressure on the SEC and inventing a complementary mechanism. It's not what could happen is that would be the investigation and prosecutions and then that would be uh, basically adding conflict to a conflict. If you like to avoid prosecutions, the, the only the, the clear solution is a complementary mechanism. That I like to say that I, probably no one will follow, but I feel I feel that my duty. I yeah, yeah. because I will help. My duty to say that. Look, there is no, a um, absolutely, and I I promise you that we will take this offer. We will even publish it in the news uh, with your proposal. I believe though that this is what the parties have been trying to do since the Oslo Accord since 1993. Yeah, now they have a different incentive, and then because they have the spending ICC and they can invent, okay, can they invent something to be sure it's not repeating the problem in the past? So that's it. If not, it is going with no solution, where we're going? We're going to an apartheid system. So Israel could not be an apartheid state, cannot. No? So um, I think uh, there's a chance, there's a chance to take the conflict as an opportunity and create a, invent a different solution. I mean, maybe you can lead that. I hope that. If you lead that, I okay. <laughs> And on this optimistic note, I would like to thank you again, 
Mr. Monero Campo. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Senator Joseph Lieberman, representing Connecticut in the United States Senate from 1989 until 2013. He was a Democratic nominee for vice president in 2000 and was the first Jewish American whom a major political party nominated for national elective office. While a member of the United States Senate, Senator Lieberman was known for his bipartisanship. He worked to establish the Department of Homeland Security in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks and strongly supported President Bush's efforts to defeat Al-Qaeda. A stalwart of the State of Israel, Senator Lieberman advanced the special relationship between the United States and Israel. Please join me in welcoming Senator Lieberman. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank Senator. you, Nitsona. Thanks for your kind words. And uh, it's great to be back with Sharad Hadin. Obviously, I wish I could be live in Israel because not only would I be seeing all of you, but all the members of my family that live there. But uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has made that not possible. It's a real honor to be here as part of this uh, law and war webinar of Sharad Hadin. And to, again, take the opportunity, Nitsana, to thank you for founding uh, Sharad Hadin Law Center in 2003 with the explicit uh, purposes of fighting terrorism uh, and protecting Israel and Jews from discrimination, bigotry, and worse, but to do so in a unique way uh, through litigation. I, I thought that if you'll give me the permission to paraphrase one of the prophets, you have uh, turned swords into lawsuits. And with great thank you very uh, much. Oh, no, it's true. And with thank great you. respect. And if I may add, um, this is a, uh, a, a perfectly, uh, this is the perfect way for a law center operating in a Jewish state to uh, try to make a difference because of the centrality of law in the uh, Jewish experience and Jewish history. I mean, we, we are known Jews as the people of the book, but really we are the people of the law. And uh, the, uh, theologically, uh, the, the um, critical moment in our history occurred on Mount Sinai in essentially a meeting of God and humans but what was the meeting about? <clears throat> it was about the law. It was about uh, God giving the, the Ten Commandments uh, to uh, Moses and to uh, the Israelite nation and really to the world. And I think in doing so, making the point that, uh, which, is, which flows from the biblical narrative that has always impressed me, um, which is that um, the, the exodus from Egypt was not, just about um, ending slavery uh, and making the point that freedom was the birthright of every human, which Israel believes and America believes, but really that freedom without law uh, would uh, inevitably lead to uh, chaos uh, and perhaps even uh, self-destruction, the disappearance of, of a people. And throughout Jewish history, <clears throat> the law has sustained um, us, um, Jewish law, but also general law. And I think what you're doing through Sh Sharad Hadin reminds us that uh, and the occasions when God intervenes and gives us laws are limited. But in the meantime, since then, uh, it's been up to people, uh, obviously religiously up to rabbis, but more generally in our society, up to lawmakers, um, law uh, enforcers, courts that interpret laws, and lawyers. And notwithstanding all the uh, jokes, at least in America, about lawyers, uh, being a lawyer is a noble profession, uh, consistent with everything I've just said uh, about the importance of law. And uh, Sharad Hadin really uh, has a record that makes that 
so important because in addition to uh, the laws uh, and the principles, we need lawyers to uh, creatively and, and uh, um, proactively, aggressively, make sure the laws are enforced and the values of the laws are abided by. And Sharad Hadin has done that beautifully. If I may, <clears throat> I was thinking uh, of a story uh, that, uh, uh, that I was involved in way back in my life. Before I was a senator, I was the Attorney General of Connecticut. And um, during the year I was running for Attorney General in the early 80s, the former Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale, came to Connecticut and spoke at a political dinner that I was at. And I was introduced to him and, and I, he, he was told that I was running for Attorney General. So he said to me that uh, he had had three offices. One was Attorney General of Minnesota. The other was United States Senator from Minnesota. And the third was Vice President of the United States. And he said, by far, the position I enjoyed most was Attorney General of Minnesota. And he said, do you know why? I said, why? He said, because when you're an Attorney General, all you're doing is suing the bastards. Well, I would say that about Sharad Hadeen. <laughs> all you're doing is <laughs> suing people who deserve to be sued on behalf of principles that we hold dear. So I thank, thank you. Thank you so much for this kind all, word, Senator. Uh, all earned. So now let me go to the, um, to the International uh, Criminal Court. And um, I want to speak, of course, as an American, but I want to speak of these, uh, our country and Israel as two great rule of law societies. I mean, America in many ways uh, derives the, the first principles of its legal system also from Sinai, but more directly from the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition of law. And, and yet we, on the face of it, the International Criminal Court, um, the ICC, would appear to be um, something that rule of law countries would, would support. But in fact, it's exactly the opposite. And the reason is that the International Criminal Court has been in some ways uh, Orwellian in the sense that, it, that it, it has operated in a very unlawful uh, way and has particularly discriminated against great rule of law countries such as our two countries, as the United States uh, and Israel. The problem is that, in my opinion, that the ICC has become intensely politicized. And for those who are uh, watching this webinar who don't know about the background of the ICC and can't imagine what I'm saying, I, I, I use this analogy. If you imagine that the United Nations General Assembly was given uh, judicial authority, investigative, prosecutorial, and judicial authority, that's what the ICC has become. I'm gonna, uh, take the liberty to quote from uh, Nitsana uh, earlier this year, which I thought stated it really quite uh, eloquently and powerfully. She said, our soldiers who follow the law are in terrible danger from enemies who have no regard for the law. Just as it is their responsibility to protect us, it is our responsibility to protect them. <clears throat> now Nitsana was obviously talking about uh, personnel of the IDF. I want to say exactly the same, embrace every word uh, she spoke on behalf of the state's uh, armed services. From the uh, beginning of the ICC as a conception, this is why the U.S. and Israel were skeptical about it and then uh, oh, actually ultimately voted it against the formation of the ICC and have never uh, become um, members. And the reality of the ICC uh, has been as bad or worse than um, U.S. and Israel authorities imagined when it was being considered. Let, let me just take a moment to share some history, which I went back in preparing uh, for this talk uh, to remind myself of. The first ideas for something like an international criminal court uh, naturally, in some ways, occurred after World War I at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, but nothing was done. Again, 
Uh, the League of Nations uh, took up the idea at a conference in Geneva in 1937, uh, also nothing done. During, uh, after the uh, Second World War, um, when there were horrific uh, acts of genocide and war crimes uh, committed, uh, there, were, uh, mili there were tribunals set up, as you know, in Nuremberg and in Tokyo, but they were international military tribunals. And they operated uh, quite effectively, and I would say judiciously and fairly, uh, within a real a rule of law a context. During the Cold War, as far as I could tell, there wasn't much, much discussion about the idea anymore, but it, it came back in the 1990s, um, in some ways, maybe coincidentally after the Cold War ended, but particularly because of uh, apparent acts of genocide and war crimes in the Balkans uh, and in Rwanda. And in both cases, um, the United Nations Security Council established special tribunals to investigate and prosecute uh, those uh, cases. And by and large, uh, they acted uh, uh, judiciously and, and appropriately. The United Nations General Assembly, in some ways in response to those cases, uh, began to discuss creating a permanent uh, criminal court. And... Uh, uh, they convened a conference in Rome in 1998, uh, which ultimately produced the Rome Statute uh, or the Treaty of Rome, which created uh, the International Criminal Court. The United States was represented there by uh, Ambassador uh, David Sheffer. Uh, David Sheffer was a well-known and respected lawyer, human rights lawyer, President Clinton had appointed him to be the first ambassador at large for war crimes, that is before the uh, uh, conference in Rome, but he was our lead uh, negotiator there. And he, um, after the, the, the treaty uh, or the recommendation was made, the statute was produced, came back and testified to Congress about why he felt strongly that the United States should not and could not sign uh, the document. I'm just going to quote a, a few of the things he said. Uh, we are left with consequences that do not serve the cause of international justice. And he went on to say the treaty purports to establish an arrangement whereby United States military forces operating overseas could be prosecuted by the ICC, even if the United States has not agreed to be bound by the treaty, which, as he concluded, was contrary to the most fundamental principles of treaty law. At the end of uh, uh, December, early January, uh, 2000, 2000, actually um, wrote a recommendation to his successor that the United States should not submit the treaty to the Senate for advice and consent until, as the president said, our fundamental uh, concerns are satisfied. And what were some of the fundamental concerns? There was the broad concern, which I'll get to in a minute, that this would end up being a very politicized body. But specifically, uh, there was no provision for jury trials. And uh, in American law, according to the American Constitution, a person particularly charged with a crime has a right to uh, trial by jury. There was, for instance, um, no statute of limitations, no matter how minor the uh, crime uh, being charged. And there was a fear that uh, President Clinton expressed that our soldiers could be prosecuted, and in fact, leaders of our government could be prosecuted uh, at the ICC for involvement in international military activities. The, the president said, as a fundamental principle that a treaty is binding on its parties only. Uh, and he said, no, there are no obligations on non-parties without their consent. And the U.S. is not a party to the Rome Statute and will not be bound by it. Uh, at that time, there was a fair amount of uh, uh, visibility and attention being given to the creation of the ICC. Again, it's now 2002 when it becomes operational. In the year or so before that, um, a, a truly bipartisan effort began in Congress to protect uh, the U.S. 
from being dragged unwillingly uh, and contrary to international law into the jurisdiction of the ICC. And this resulted in legislation that was adopted in 2002 called the American Service Members Protection Act. It was a very uh, strong piece of legislation that prohibited any U.S. involvement uh, in um, the ICC, uh, any support of its work, uh, uh, prohibited any information being provided to the court, uh, and uh, also prohibited extradition of any uh, personnel and uh, people from within the United States by uh, uh, U.S. governmental entities to the uh, ICC. There was even in the law a provision that authorized the President of the United States to take any steps that he or she deemed necessary uh, to obtain the release of any American detained by the ICC. Um, this scared people, <laughs> and in Europe, uh, uh, they began to refer to the American Service Members Protection Act as the uh, U.S. Netherlands Invasion Act. <laughs> of course, that never happened, but that's how s a serious people uh, felt about it. There was also a provision giving the U.S. government authority to withdraw U.S. military assistance from countries ratifying the um, ICC Treaty. Uh, in the Senate, um, the, the bill was adopted by 74 to 22, strong bipartisan support, including um, uh, the then senator from Connecticut, or one of them named Lieberman. I don't know whatever happened to him, but uh, anyway, he was there. But another one you've heard about lately, Senator uh, Joe Biden of Delaware yeah. voted for right. the American Service Members uh, Protection Act, and it has been and remains in effect. Look, part of what underlies this is for the United States and Israel is that um, we feel very strongly that we have uh, laws, both within our military and in domestic laws, that uh, enable us to deal uh, as rule of law countries with American, American military personnel and Israeli military personnel who may violate uh, our codes of uh, military conduct and law, and God forbid, uh, to commit war crimes or crimes uh, against humanity. That that either can be uh, carried out uh, in a just way, as it has been in uh, uh, military courts, but also crimes of genocide are punishable within our uh, general um, legal system. Um, let me go back now in a way to uh, focus on what's wrong with the International Criminal Court. Part of it is, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, uh, th that the way it works explains why it works so unfairly. Uh, just as the United Nations General Assembly, every country which is a member of the ICC gets parties, which in turn chooses the personnel who sit on the court. Many of the ICC members, just as many of the members of the um, UN General Assembly, are not democracies and not rule of law countries. Uh, they choose judges and prosecutors based on uh, what I've been involved in in my political career, but doesn't belong in a court, which is uh, political horse trading. Also in the um, often in the narrow interest of members of, of the ruling elite of member states. The, the current chief prosecutor, uh, for example, uh, was part of one of Africa's most undemocratic and abusive regimes, and yet uh, is the chief prosecutor today. Uh, I would sum it up by saying that the ICC judges and prosecutors answer only to the assembly of state parties which is an unelected body, unthinkable really in either of our countries, which in turn answers to the governments of the state parties, uh, many of which are also unelected. In my opinion, the ICC, like unfortunately some other agencies of the United Nations, has also been wasteful. It spent over uh, $2 billion, billion over the years that it's been uh, operational and uh, really hasn't shown uh, much for it. 
except that it's quite good at harassing uh, governments and individuals and dragging on trials for years, sometimes um, while an accused uh, is sitting in pretrial uh, confinement. In the particular case of the United States, the ICC has attempted, just as we worried way back, 20, uh, almost 20 years ago, to investigate uh, American uh, soldiers involved in Afghanistan, uh, even though the U.S. has not consented to the jurisdiction of the court, and even though we have a robust process for the investigation of war crimes allegations uh, by our uh, military personnel. In fact, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the U U.S. Um, uh, agreed to a status of forces agreement with the uh, Afghan uh, government, uh, to an, which explicitly says that the criminal prosecution of Americans for conduct in Afghanistan is to be conducted in American uh, courts martial. The Afghan government uh, also said that they would not, they promised they would not participate uh, or cooperate in any way in the transfer of U.S. service members uh, to the ICC. And yet, the, um, um, as I'll get to in a moment, the ICC has continued to pursue that. The other fear that we have had, because some of our European allies are, are members of the ICC, is that uh, one of our allies under the ICC uh, rules might be required to honor an ICC warrant and arrest an American service member serving, for instance, in Germany or Italy, uh, which is outrageous and uh, uh, unacceptable. Um, the ICC focus on Israel, which you're probably more aware of, is itself clearly unjust, unjust and unequal. Uh, just as the case in, in the uh, U.S., uh, it is well known, certainly here in the U.S., uh, with admiration that the IDF uh, goes out of its way, makes very uh, extensive efforts uh, to uh, both abide by the laws of uh, military conduct, a uh, code of conduct, but also to protect civilians, as certainly is the case uh, with regard to the multiple steps that were taken to warn civilians of imminent attack in, for instance, Gaza, which has been a focus for um, the ICC of interest, and uh, including also canceling the targeting of locations in which it's believed that civilians might be present, uh, and allowing medical and humanitarian uh, supplies to reach Gaza's uh, civilian uh, population. Um, I want to uh, go back uh, now uh, just to go over how this uh, ICC has been responded to by American administration. Um, the Bush administration signed, President Bush signed the American Service Members Protection Act, and uh, throughout his administration, we kept our distance and were worried about what it might be up to. Uh, the Obama administration uh, um, moved a little bit closer, never became a member state or submitted the treaty to the Senate, but Harold Coe, who was the Assistant Secretary of State, uh, involved in this area in, in the Obama administration said, and I quote, after 12 years, I think we reset the default on the U.S. relationship with the ICC from hostility to positive engagement. And what that meant was that uh, the Obama administration had expressed an intention to cooperate with the ICC in uh, capacity as uh, an observer. Uh, so uh, a, a slightly warmer relationship, or at least le uh, less uh, worrisome, more worrisome to us, less full of worry about what the ICC would do. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear that it's been different uh, since President Trump uh, came into office. Uh, in a speech, in the most explicit and, and brief way to say this is that in his speech to the United Nations General Assembly in that. Uh, 2018, uh, President Trump drew parallels, which were quite apt, in my opinion, between the ICC and the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. And he said, uh, the United States will provide no support to the ICC. We will never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. End quote. In uh, April of 2019, 
um, because um, the prosecutor at um, the ICC, Fatu Pensura, um, was uh, making clear that she was uh, going to begin an investigation of U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan, the Trump administration revoked uh, uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda's visa uh, to the United States. And when that investigation actually began uh, in March of this year, a month or two later, the Trump uh, administration responded with sanctions against the ICC. It also um, uh, um, more aggressively negotiated bilateral immunity agreements with several countries which prohibit transfer of U.S. citizens to the ICC by any state signing um, one of those uh, BIAs. So um, you may have heard that there's an election for president going on in the United States. And uh, so it's a... It's Very quite nice a rumor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the ru I can confirm the rumor. <laughs> it's happened. Uh, <laughs> So obviously there's a, a chance right now by the polling, it's more likely to happen than not that Vice President Biden uh, will become president. So naturally, uh, uh, there's been no discussion that I've heard or seen of the ICC in this presidential campaign, but it's one of those things that will be important. And of course, we have to hope that uh, a, a President Biden will not drift back toward the Obama administration position on the ICC, although it was Again, not uh, to submit the a treaty to uh, the Senate for advice and consent or, or to think about becoming members, but just to assume observer status, which I think begins to give the ICC credibility it doesn't deserve. And uh, there'll be a lot of us who will be reminding uh, a, a President Biden, if that should happen, that he was very wise in supporting the American service members uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, two. Um, I, I, uh, in the meantime, look, I, 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 in preparing for this talk, I, I um, looked at possible reforms of the ICC, and um, it, it's possible to think of some that have been recommended from outside, such as the ICC adopting a clear statement that it would never go against any uh, uh, anybody who, whose country did not consent to its jurisdiction. Some others have suggested that it might simply become a place where uh, separate tribunals are authorized in cases where a, 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 a reasonable case has been made that genocide or war crimes have been committed. But uh, I, I'm not, I don't hold high hopes for any of those. Uh, I, I must say that in the end of my review of this matter, uh, I would say that the best thing that could happen for the rule of law in the world would be for the ICC to be abolished and for us uh, to find a way to go back to what happened in the 90s with uh, uh, the Balkans and Rwanda, where um, the United Nations Security Council created ad hoc tribunals to, uh, to investigate. But uh, I can tell you from long experience in the federal government, that once an agency of the government is created, it almost never dies. And that whether it serves a good purpose or not, and I'm sure that's true probably of the United Nations. So it, it makes the work that um, the groups like Sharad Hadin are doing uh, critically important. You probably know about this, but I just wanna say how much I appreciate that Sharad Hadin was the first NGO to file uh, several communications um, which are uh, in the nature of a criminal complaint at the ICC, in which uh, it alleged that the ICC uh, should open investigations into activities of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority in launching rockets against Israeli civilian targets and in paying salaries uh, to people convicted of terrorism uh, offenses. And it, 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 in, it, in its characteristically creative and unique way, um, uh, Sharad Adin alleged a jurisdictional basis for its um, complaint uh, that I think is indisputable, which was that uh, Mahmoud Abbas and almost every senior Palestinian Authority official is a Jordanian citizen and holds a Jordanian passport, as is uh, Khaled Mashal, who's the former head of Hamas, and Jordan is a state party 
a member of the ICC, and therefore uh, they're all subject to its jurisdiction. On the other side, again, I thank the ICC for submitting an observation, um, a kind of uh, uh, appearance and point of view to the current ICC investigation and representation of Israeli farmers uh, whose fields are um, consistently uh, burned and attacked by, um, by, by terrorists. So uh, there's a lot of work for, for Sharad Hadid to do. Uh, in that, uh, I hope and pray that the United States will be an ally. Um, uh, it's unique and important uh, work to sustain the rule of law and to uh, have the ICC uh, really <clears throat> stop uh, violating the law in the name of what it considers to be the law. Uh, it's been a great honor to talk to you and give a kind of keynote to your discussion today. You've got two wonderful uh, uh, speakers to follow, Ambassador Danny Danone, who we miss in uh, Washington and specifically in New York. He, he did a wonderful job here at the United Nations. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that you have given him an opportunity to stay productive in the, the afterlife. Absolutely. Absolutely. The also, thank for Professor uh, Luis Moreno uh, Ocampo. And uh, uh, Nitsana, again, thanks to you. Thanks to Abiel. Thanks to Robert Feldmeyer. It's a pleasure to work with your council. And I look forward to seeing you soon, maybe this year or certainly next year in Yerushalayim. Amen. <laughs> Thank Amen. you so much, Senator. Thank you for joining us for the Shurat Adin's online discussion of the threat of the international criminal. Shurat Adin is proud to be the first NGO which confronted the Palestinian authorities' misuse of the ICC and will continue to demand that the ICC act impartially against real atrocity and seize politically motivated investigations into the one true democracy in the Middle East. Israel. I would like to encourage everyone who is interested in the work of Shurat Adin again to go to our website israelawcenter.org, sign up for our mailing list and follow us on Twitter and Facebook too. I hope everyone found this program educational and enjoyable. As you may know, Shurat Adin Law Center is entirely funded by the generous donations of our supporters worldwide. Our funding comes from private individuals and foundations who believe in Shurat Adin's mission and are amazed by our unprecedented legal successes. We fight on behalf of the terror victims and others who have no one else to stand up for. Please become a Shurat Adin's partner. Like everyone, our law center has badly financially injured by this pandemic. Unfortunately, the struggle against the terror groups and raw regimes must continue. Therefore, we hope you will consider us in your charitable giving so we may continue to fight back. Thank you for joining us for this online conference. Please stay safe in these challenging times.